Passion, the Passion of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to John. You may sit, please. So Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them, and when Jesus saw, said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that had been spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. And since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside of the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, Are you not also one of those man disciples, are you? He said, Oh, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it, and they were warming themselves. And Peter also was standing with them, and he was warming himself. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in your synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. So why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Simon was standing and warming himself when they asked him, Are you... Are you not one of his disciples? He denied it, and he said, I am not. And one of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning, they themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation 
do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves then, and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered him, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, Then what is truth? And after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, Look, I find no case against this man, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They replied with a shout, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a bandit. And then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns, and they put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe, and they kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. And Pilate went out again and said, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus, he came out. Wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, There you go. Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. And the Jews then answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. <laughs> now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be king sets himself against the emperor. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, 
Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate asked them one more time, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. And then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. And then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. The tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top to the bottom. And so they said to one, one another, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own house. And after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate, to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. And then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says this, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After all these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. And so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had also first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden
morning there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, O Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for love of yourself. Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. You know nothing, John Snow. Anyone know what that's from? Game of Thrones, one of my favorites. It's spoken by Ygritte, a young woman from the wall, to Jon Snow, a young man of the Night's Watch who defends the wall. She's essentially telling him, you may think you know all about my world, but really, you know nothing. It's something she tells him over and over again throughout the series, each time saying, you know nothing, having a different connotation. At first, it's an insult. You know nothing, Jon Snow. And then an exasperation at what she feels is something obvious that he's missing. You know nothing, Jon Snow. And then, finally, as a way of saying, I love you, and I see you more clearly than you see yourself. You know nothing, Jon Snow. It's the last words that she says to him as she tragically dies in his arms. By the time I'm done with this talk, you'll understand why I chose this as my opening line. I love our Holy Week tradition, where we allow ourselves to honor and feel each day of Holy Week, as it happened, that we allow ourselves this day in particular, to grieve. We literally force ourselves to sit with our grief by sitting in this service. We take today to be sad so that Sunday can be all about the joy and triumph of the resurrection. But sitting with grief is hard. There's nothing I fear more than grief, so I'm glad I don't have to do this alone today. Without knowing it, fear of grief actually built a wall inside of my heart. Maybe not a wall as massive as the one in Game of Thrones, but still pretty big. At first it protected me from completely falling apart after my own mother died. Something to brace myself against. My wall was built brick by brick with the loss of several loved ones in my 20s. Before I knew it, this wall was much taller than I was. Couldn't even see over it. I thought it was protecting me. But the thing about a wall is that it not only blocks out pain, but it also starts to block out love. It wasn't like I couldn't feel love. It's simply like trying to talk to someone over a wall. You can hear them, but not as clearly. But luckily for me, the Trinity came from my wall. My wall wasn't knocked down in one fell swoop from the flaming blue fire from the undead dragon like in Game of Thrones, but slower, brick by brick by brick. God wants to help you tear down your wall too, if you let him. In fact, it's one of the main reasons that Jesus came to us, to walk among us, to break down the walls we had built between ourselves and God. No one knew this better than his disciples and followers. If you were a disciple or follower of Jesus, today was the worst day of your life. Your Savior, 
your Messiah, Emmanuel, the one you thought you knew would always be there, the one who was going to change the world, the one you thought was safe to depend on, your Lord, died. He not only died, but it happened in a way that you would have known was impossible only a week before. He was betrayed by one of his disciples, betrayed with a kiss. Then another disciple, Peter, whose name literally means rock, one of the one who Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. His rock literally denies knowing him three times. The people who less than a week before were cheering him and calling, Hosanna! are now yelling, crucify him. He is accused of blasphemy. Blasphemy is the act of insulting, showing contempt, or lack of reverence to a deity. The high priests accuse him of blasphemy. He is humiliated. In life, he is mocked as king of the Jews, and in death, he dies on a cross, which was meant to be the most humiliating death possible. He is tortured and flogged and dies in excruciating pain. If I were a disciple of Jesus, I would be in utter shock, with my mouth hanging open, feeling like the bottom had just dropped out from beneath me, thinking, how could this have gone so wrong so fast? Even though he repeatedly told them what would happen and showed them that nothing was impossible with God, they still couldn't imagine a future where dying on a cross didn't mean life was over. <clears throat> I'm sure it felt like life was over. If I was one of his disciples, I would be grieving not only for what happened to Jesus, but for the future I had planned with him. What I thought was supposed to happen and I would also be angry at Jesus. Angry that he didn't stop this from happening. He allowed this to happen. Jesus himself says to Pilate in John 19, 11, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. AKA, Pilate, you may think you know all about my world, but really, you know nothing. He could have snapped his fingers and saved himself from this fate, this horrific, painful, slow death. He could have saved me from the pain of having him die and living in a future without him physically present. So why did he stop this? I think the easiest way to understand Jesus' intentions was explained in the story of Shaq. For those of you who haven't heard this story, it's about a man named Mac who is stuck in the grief over the death of one of his children when he is invited to spend the weekend with God. It is a profound and moving story of how God came for Max Ball. And they, in turn, restored a relationship together. One of my favorite parts of the story is when Max is with Sophia, Wisdom, in a cave, and she's helping him how we un understand how we unfairly judge ourselves, others, and God. He thinks he can do a better job than God, so she asks him to judge between his two children. One will go to heaven, and one will go to hell. She lists out all of the sins they have done against him. But not even one of those sins felt like justification for sending them to hell. He defiantly says, I can never choose between my children and send one to hell. But she reminds him, if you want to be the judge, a choice must be made. So he yells out, I refuse to make this choice. Choose me. Take me instead. It is moving, and you instantly know that's exactly what Jesus did. As an act of unconditional love, he said, I refuse to let anyone go to hell. Choose me. I will 
to take their place. Therefore, we know the only thing really holding him to that cross was love for us. Not the nails, not the rope, his love. And not once did he ever say, I changed my mind. They're not worth it. But that doesn't make it any easier for those of us who love him to see him go through this torture. It doesn't make each bang of the hanger, hammer driving nails through his body not hit our hearts as well. And maybe worse was the absolute silence and absence of Jesus for the rest of Friday and all of Saturday. He was gone, gone from the living, gone from this earth, and I imagine they lost faith that he would ever come back and keep his promises. I'm sure it felt like the enemy won and that God himself was defeated. I'm sure, as if it wasn't bad enough to grieve the loss of a friend, a mentor, a savior, we grieve for Mary, who lost all those things and more. She lost her son. How easy it would be for her to build a wall from pain. She certainly could have used enough bricks. And Jesus did his best to prevent this wall from forming by giving her to the care of the disciple whom he loved, thereby giving her another sacred mission to be a mother to John and to us all. And even though Jesus' death and sacrifice was meant to be an act of unconditional love, a lot of people see and experience Jesus' death through the broken lens of guilt and shame instead of love. Guilt and shame in the belief that Jesus had no choice and was forced to do this. That it's our fault. My fault. Your fault. Guilt and shame feeds the lie that we are not really deserving of God's love, when in fact the opposite is true. With his death, Jesus said, You are not only worthy of my love, you are worth dying for. And if it was me, if it was Matt, and I know when it was Jesus, the last thing I would want, they would want, is for any child with to live with guilt and shame instead of love. Jesus never used guilt and shame to heal. Why do we think that guilt and shame inspire a trusting relationship with the God of love? Guilt and shame are fed by fear, not love. When you motivate behavior with guilt and shame, you might get some growth, but no one flourishes. It's like growing a plant in the shade versus the sun. It will grow, but not thrive and reach its full potential. And seriously, what parent would want that for their children? If I can step in and take my son's place for a death like this, Maybe no mistake, I would do it in a heartbeat, without hesitation. I would be terrified and it would be awful, but I would do it because I love him. Not because he did anything to deserve this love, but simply because he is my child and I love him unconditionally. He is the living expression of love between my husband and myself. Taking, this, taking his place would be an expression of my love and protection, and the only thing I would want him to know in his heart was that he was loved deeply, that he was protected and safe, and to know that he was worth dying for. And the very best way to remember and honor my love for him would be to spread my love across the whole world. And the only thing that could make this sacrifice Seeing meaningless is if it was used to make him spend the rest of his life behind a wall of guilt and shame. For a long time, I used to judge if people were telling the truth based on how much I believed that they believed they were telling the truth. But somehow it would show in their body language and you would be able to see right through them. But I've learned that just because you believe something is true doesn't make it so. 
For hundreds of years, people knew the earth was flat. It seems silly now, but back then, that was something everyone knew. Compared to what we know now, we knew nothing back then. In that same way, some people think that they know that they are not good enough to go to heaven, worthy to be loved, that they should live in shame and guilt that Jesus died for them. But just like John Snow, they know nothing. And so did we before Jesus came for our walls. For Jesus didn't only die to save us from sin, he died for the lies that built the walls. He died to shatter the lies that you have to be perfect to be worthy of God's love. That you have to be ashamed of the deepest parts of yourself. That the worst parts of you are the real you. That you see yourself more clearly than God ever could. That you are not worthy, not good enough. But it's not true. And if you believe that, then you know nothing of Jesus' love. So know today that it's okay to be sad. Sit with your grief. Be heartbroken that our Savior was tortured and died on the cross. Be devastated for Mary that she had to watch her son go through this painful and awful death. Cry your eyes out to all the people whose hearts were turned in fear against Jesus and God's love. But don't for a minute take this sadness and grief and let fear turn it into shame and guilt. Know that you are so loved and cherished by God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you are worth dying for. I am worth dying for. He is worth dying for. She is worth dying for. You may know this intellectually, but I need you to know this in your heart. So you're going to repeat after me. I am worthy of God's love. I am worth dying for. I am worth dying for. Again, I am worthy of God's love. I am worthy of God's love. I am worth dying for. I am worth dying for. Okay. Pop quiz. If you've been paying attention, this will be easy. I do this with my son every night to remind him how much I love him. And if he were here, he'd tell you it's really easy. The answer to every question is no. I imagine that this is exactly what God wants you to hear, so I will stand in place of Jesus tonight. Is there any limit to how much I love you? No. Nope. Is it possible that I could run out of love for you? No. Nope. Nope. Is there anywhere you could go that my love couldn't reach you? No. Nope. Nope. Even on the other side of the Game of Thrones wall? I mean, that's pretty big. No, no, no. Is there anything you could do or say to stop me from loving you? No. Is it possible you see yourself more clearly than I do? No. Of course not. I have the best of you. <laughs> Are you unworthy of my love? No, no. Even when I die, was that the end of my love for you? No. no. Well then, take this act of pure love and let it make you stronger. Take this act of love and honor it by spreading it across the whole world. Take this love and return to God's loving embrace, hearing Jesus said, say, I died not because I had to, but because I love you and you are worth all of it. And if you can't do that, if you can't know that in your heart, then you are just like Jon Snow, and you know nothing. <laughs> and all the people said, Amen.